Hello everybody and welcome to today's video. Before I begin, I'd just like to say a brief word of thanks to everybody that subscribed to my channel on YouTube. I think this is an excellent community for chess here on YouTube and I feel very grateful to be part of it. I've certainly learned a great deal from enjoying the videos provided by other YouTube members and I look forward to providing many videos of my own uh, and I hope that it can be of some pleasure and enjoyment to other people. So thanks again for your support. I really appreciate that. Um, so this is part two of my three-part series on this brilliant endgame by Anatoly Karpov. And it's taken from Milan 1975, which was the year that he became world champion. Karpov's last move, where we left off, was a4 and the purpose of this move is to fix these queenside pawns which is a very useful move at this stage of the end game and he wanted to get that in before following up with the rest of his plans his bishop is still p very well placed on the d1 square it's exerting some control over the f and g pawns and it's currently tying up this white king to the defense of these pawns. We'll see over the next few moves how white has to waste some time in order to get these pawns off the diagonal. And so it kind of justifies the, the move bishop d1 earlier and shows its strategic significance. So how did white continue here? Well. He simply continues his kingside initiatives with h5. He's hoping to initiate some exchanges of pawns which should favor him as the defender. Karpov would like to play this thematic push, f5 check, with the idea of forcing the white king away from the defense of this important d5 square. If he can get white to relinquish control of that square, he can start to navigate with his king to this important b3 square, which will be very critical later in the game. However, he has to find the right time to do that. And he, and he prefers not to complicate the position by playing f5, which gives white more options, and instead plays the simple g takes h. G, so we see um, g takes h5 and g takes h5, and only now f5 check. So at this point in the game, white had two main cho choices of action. He could either take a passive defense by coming to e3 with his king, or a more aggressive active defense with king f4. And it might be worth just pausing the video for a minute or two here, and just trying to decide for yourself which would be the best course of action. What would you do if you had the white pieces? Okay, so in the game, the white player came to e3, a passive defense, which I think was the right option. Let's look at al the alternative, king f4, for a minute. It's, wor it's worth just spending a minute to look at the alternative line, the active defense. So after king f4 and the natural king d5, we would have had king takes f5, bishop takes f3, and now king g5 is forced to defend the pawn on h5. And then after king to c4, we can see that things haven't worked out so well for white because his king can no longer participate in the defense on the queen side and it's going to be very easy for black to defend his own pawn by bringing his bishop onto this um, the b1 h7 diagonal. Okay, so let's go back to the game continuation, which was king e3. So again, black 
continues his plan with king d5. Now we see h6. Black is starting to get his pawns off of this diagonal. And after king c4 and f4, black has sorry, white has succeeded in getting his pawns off of his diagonal. But notice that his own pawns on the f and h files and black's pawns on the b and c files impede the freedom of his own bishop. So um, black's bishop is now much better and also his king is in a much more active square. So now we see king b3. Black has accomplished something useful now in this position. And we're kind of at a cr critical crossroads here. If white was able to now make two moves, um, let's say king d2 and bishop g7, he would have a, a very good fortress which looks almost certainly to be a drawn position because despite the additional pawn there's no way for black to make any progress after this. However, since he wasted two moves in order to get these pawns off, he's kind of behind now and he doesn't have the ability to make both of these moves and so the opportunity never presents itself. White here tried bishop g7, but I think king d2 has some very interesting variations, and I'd like to share some of those with you now. So let's see, king d2, uh, and then there's a very interesting line that starts now with the bishop sacrifice. So king takes b2, king takes d d1, snapping up the bishop, c4, bishop e7, maintaining the defense of the pawn on a3, now b5, bishop f8, c3, and now bishop g7 seems to be forced, um, just pinning, pinning the pawn on c3, preventing the, the push. Um, King, a th King takes a3 here would be a mistake, and I'll show you why. King takes a3, King c2, b4, and now there's a very interesting way to force a draw by sacrificing the bishop, returning the material. So a bishop takes, pawn takes, king takes, and there's no way for black to make any progress here. So there's another interesting idea though, an alternative to king takes a3, and that's a beautiful move, b4. And I think this wins by force now. Um, so after a takes b, a3, king to e2, and now king c2, and this a pawn is going to queen. A2 immediately would be a mistake, and the reason for this is that white now has king d3. He's putting some pressure on that c-pawn, and if the pawn was to queen, we can just play bishop c3 check, and it actually is a win for white now, because after the king moves and the bishop takes, that b-pawn is on its way to becoming a queen. So there's some very interesting lines here. Well that concludes part two of today's video and I'll be posting part three shortly. I hope you enjoyed today's video and thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.